Welcome back everyone, this is History with Hilberts and today I'm going to be talking about the election of 1925 and as the flag behind can tell you, it's going to be the election of 1925 in the Weimar Republic of Germany. Now this morning I made a video on the reparations that Germany had to pay after the First World War and after this video I'm going to be making a few more on the sort of political period in between the sort of 1924 era and 1928 in Weimar Germany to help you guys out who have asked me to do so. So the election of 1925, this was actually a presidential election and the reason it was held was well because Friedrich Ebert, who had been the president since the get-go of the Weimar Republic on the 9th of November 1918, he on the 28th of February 1925, he kicks the bucket and he dies. So they have to elect a new president. How are they going to do this? Well, they're going to follow the Weimar Constitution. And the Weimar Constitution says that a full election has to be held to decide upon who becomes president. So everyone has a vote on who becomes the president. And unless half of these votes all go to one candidate, they have to hold another ballot. And a special rule for this other ballot is that candidates can swap in and out with a different candidate, even if they were the one who people voted for in the first round, in this second round. So, the first round of candidates, who are they? For the KPD, who is the uh, Communist Party of Germany, you have Ernst Thälmann. For the SPD, the Socialists Otto Braun. For the Zentrum Partei, which is the uh, Centre Party, the uh, Catholic Religious Party, we have Wilhelm Marx. For the DVP and the DNVP, so that's right and the far right, we have Karl Lieres. For the NSDAP, we have Erich Ludendorff, and obviously the NSDAP would later become known as the Nazi Party. So, what happens? Well, the um, SPD, they decide that they don't think Otto Braun has a very good chance of winning, so they put their vote behind Wilhelm Marx instead. So, that dr leaves one to drop out. Now, the KPD, they go full throttle steam ahead with Ernst Thälmann, but this leaves a problem for the left, because that means that on the left there are two candidates, and on the right they swap Karl Jahres for Paul von Hindenburg. So we have two candidates on the left and one on the right. Now the NSDAP hardly got any votes, so Ludendorff didn't stand a chance, so he doesn't make it through to the second round of the election. But this is a problem for the left, because as I said, there are now two members standing on the left and one member standing on the right. So, what are the results? Well, in last place, we have the communist Ernst Thälmann, who got a small, meagre 6.4% of the vote. So he definitely hasn't won. But who has? In second place, we get Wilhelm Marx, the Zentrum candidate supported by the SPD, with 45.3% of the vote, excruciatingly close to Paul von Hindenburg, with 48.3% of the vote, winning him the title of presidency of the Weimar Republic in 1925. Now a little bit about the winner. So who is Hindenburg? And if you've been studying this course, you'll know that we've already come across this guy. This is Paul von Hindenburg, and as you can see, he is likely going to be a monarchist in his military uniform, and you'd be absolutely correct. Now, he stood at an impressive 6 foot 5 inches, so this is a big guy, taller than I am. And Paul von Hindenburg, he's a military guy, as you can see from the picture. Now, he started very young. He joins the Prussian army, because remember when he was a young man, the Weimar Republic wasn't there. In fact, the German Empire wasn't even there. This was back in the old days of when Germany was split into different states. And he joined the Prussian army during the Austro-Prussian War and then the Franco-Prussian War, where he served as a lieutenant. And he absolutely loved fighting. That's something about Hindenburg. All the other commanders, when they were besieging Paris, they were saying that it was dreadful that the French wouldn't surrender, but Hindenburg loved it because it enabled him and his men to slaughter the French. Don't blame him. He's a good German. Don't quote me on that one. He retired from the army in 1911 after a successful but otherwise quite peaceful career because Germany didn't really go into war up until the First World War after the Franco-Prussian War. But he rejoins the German army in 1914 as Field Marshal General. 
and he crushes the Russian army several times in battle on the Eastern Front, so the most glorious of which is definitely the Battle of Tannenberg in 1914. The Russians suffered ridiculously high casualties, and the Germans did relatively well. Now, another one that springs to mind is the uh, Masurian Lakes, where he also encircled an entire Russian army and destroyed them, so he, he is basically a war hero. And Hindenburg, he's definitely a monarchist and part of the Junker elite class of the Prussian aristocracy. And there were, in fact, rumours that before he put himself forward as a candidate instead of uh, Karl Jahres, uh, that he actually asked the exiled Kaiser in the Netherlands... <laughs> for permission. So how did Germany respond to Hindenburg becoming the president? Well, to the surprise and relief of many Germans, because remember Hindenburg is this old Junker class, old Prussian aristocracy guy, you know, with these monarchistic, anti-democratic feelings. He actually upholds the democracy and he doesn't abuse his powers, which are granted to him by the as president in the constitution. So, for example, you have Article 48, where if there is reasonable threat, the president can bypass all parliament and take power solely into his own hands, because remember, the president as well controls the army. But Hindenburg doesn't do this. He doesn't abuse the power. So in that respect, a lot of people were very relieved. And some people were definitely surprised as well because they thought, well, this old guy, you know, we're going to go back to this authoritarian state. Now, because he was a monarchist and from the Juncker class present, a lot of the elite in the army became warmer to the Republic. But this was a bit fallacious because really they only became warmer to the Republic because they thought that Hindenburg was going to return Germany to a similar state as it had been in the German Reich. So as it had been under the Kaiser. And I think people called him the Essatz Kaiser, which means that sort of the... Uh, the second Kaiser or the, you know, the next Kaiser kind of thing. They thought he was going to be that. So people on the right, they sort of became more positive about the Weimar Republic. Because remember, the people on the right, the elite, the army, uh, school teachers, those kind of people, they were very against it. They preferred the authoritarian Kaiser, you know, this nationalistic, imperialistic feel to this new democracy which Weimar promised. And in Hindenburg, they saw a reincarnation of the old ways, of the Kaiser. And some of them would definitely have been disappointed that Hindenburg didn't pursue the right wing, you know, the anti-democratic authoritarian sort of area more than he did. Although he does definitely stick true to the right wing things. Like, uh, I think, I believe he bans pornography and he has several uh, homophobic laws and things which the right wing would have appreciated in this period. Now, many on the left felt that the Republic had definitely failed to bring about true equality. And they cited things like the massive uprisings which had taken place, especially in the early years of Weimar. So what springs to mind is the Spartacist movement, the 5th of January 1919, as well as, you know, the Ruhr uprising, which was in 1920 at the same time as the Kapuch. And they felt that because they had been so violently suppressed, for example, that Ebert had openly signed a treaty with Kruner, who was an older commander, you know, from the very period where these left-wing guys thought they'd been oppressed from. He was, you know, a commander under the Kaiser as well. And now Ebert had signed a treaty with him, the ebert Kruner Pact, on, I believe it was the 10th of November uh, in 1918. And he had actually sent in the Freikorps, who were these, you know, these freebooting bands of right-wing, deadly veterans returned from the war to subjugate them. So they felt that they they were just as, almost just as oppressed as they had been before, and that the, the Weimar Republic was, wasn't was really giving them the equality they wanted, especially when Hindenburg was elected president, because, well, he was of the old guard, he was of the old class. And then we also all have the Mittelstand, or the middle class, and they're as divided as ever, really. Because it's a very it's a very diverse group. There's lots of different religious uh, backgrounds in the middle class. There's social background as well, obviously. So it's it's a huge area. It's not really one group, and they they were in two minds really. Because some of them, a lot of the middle class, were definitely very much for the authoritarian, for the old ways. Whereas others 
well then less for the old ways and more for the new ways but then they had been betrayed they had been the hardest hit the group because of the hyperinflation the economic crisis which they would blame and rightfully so the spd who had allowed inflation to go on so that they didn't have to pay as much for reparations so in a way they'd be in two minds i think the middle the middle classes would be quite favorable of hindenburg but obviously he didn't return germany back to the old reich so they probably wouldn't be too favorable of him in the end all right everyone so it's been a little quick video but in this one which i like to call the empire strikes back because you know it's hindenburg of the old guard uh, i've talked about the election of 1925 if you have any other questions you can always just leave a comment down in the comment section below and i will get back to you as soon as i can now i know i've said this before but i will start answering some comments soon i've just had a very busy time back end of next week saturday sunday monday i'll be answering those comments don't you worry so leave them i will be replying all right everyone i hope you've enjoyed this video if you'd like any extra learning resources for this topic then yeah just leave a comment below just ask me send me a youtube message or whatever and i hope to see you in the next one don't forget to watch the other videos as well if you are interested all right everyone thanks very much for watching this has been history with hilbert with some more weimar republic auf wiedersehen